I'm Don Shelby. And I'm Mike Walter. Every day of the week, WCCO Television wants to inform you of the important issues that shape your community. And the world events that are making history. That's why every weekend, Channel 4 highlights the day's happenings on the Weekend Report. And the Weekend Report also reflects the lighter side of the weekends with special features and sports events. So join us along with weatherman Bill Carlson and sportscaster Hal Scott. The Weekend Report on Channel 4. When you have a school problem, you probably turn to a school administrator. But not all school problems can be solved by the school administrator alone. Some require the resources and involvement of the total community. And that is where you come in. This has been brought to you by the American Association of School Administrators. Mike Douglas, weekday afternoons at 3.30, here on Channel 4. WCCO Television, Minneapolis, St. Paul. From WCCO Television, the Northwest's leading news station, this is the 10 p.m. report. Good evening, everybody. In our news headlines tonight, the victorious American hockey team tries to work out normally, even though their heads are still spinning from their surprise Lake Placid win over the Russians. The Spirit Mountain Ski Resort in Minnesota is trying to figure out a way to stay alive financially. And out at Met Stadium tonight, the North Stars are handling the New York Rangers in a big game. We'll have that story coming up in sports. But this day, February 23rd, is historic for the country and for a very special athlete, 21-year-old Eric Hyten. He's the first man to have won five gold medals in Winter Olympic Games. And he capped his winning streak this morning with a world record win of the long 10,000 meter race in Lake Placid, finishing six seconds off the world's record. President Carter has invited Haydn and the entire U.S. Olympic team, along with the entire U.S. Olympic Committee, to the White House for official congratulations. And Hal Scott will have the results of today's events later in sports, Mike. And Don, tonight on the other side of the world, five men representing the United Nations are in Tehran, where they will try to negotiate the freedom of the 50 American hostages. The fact-finding commission landed in Tehran earlier and received a warm welcome from the Iranian government. Tomorrow, the five will confer with President Bonnie Sider, and it's not known yet if the hostages will be the first order of business. While the commissioners were introduced, they had already heard the latest from the Ayatollah Khomeini, that now Iran will not consider releasing the hostages until April, when the Iranian parliament can meet and decide their fate. The Ayatollah made that statement from his hospital bed where he's recovering from a mild heart attack. He directed all Iranian people who have been tortured or persecuted by the former Shah to make their statements to that commission during the next two weeks. The U.S. reaction to this Iranian change of heart? Well, we got that today from the State Department, and it was not one of great surprise. Very difficult for us to read exactly what is meant by this. I think that we could uh, debate it forever to almost no purpose. Honey, were you surprised by this uh, <clears throat> statement of Khomeini? I think after almost four months, it is impossible to be surprised by anything that occurs in connection with this. And on the official stance tonight is uh, one of optimism for that UN delegation. There is still some hope for successful negotiation. Well, meantime, north of Iran in Afghanistan, the Soviets have already declared a state of emergency and martial law in that country. Two independent sources have already reported from Afghanistan that as many as 4,000 Afghan troops have mutinied against the Soviets. The Russians are now ordering that the Afghans fire on civilian demonstrators, but many of the soldiers reportedly ignored those orders and joined the civilians with rifles. More gun battling went on today, and hundreds are reported dead. In other news, a move to defeat the military draft surfaced at St. Paul's McAllister College today. The day-long teach-in featured University of Minnesota professor 
Mulford Q. Sibley, he urged those present to get involved politically and defeat draft registration. Workshops also dealt with women in the draft and the economics of militarism. Russian hockey fans today watch the tape replay of the Soviet Union's loss to the United States. The Russians in Moscow crowded around television sets and department stores, and most watched in stunned silence as their team, considered invincible, was beaten. One fan noted the youth of the American players, and he remarked that perhaps the Soviet Union now needs a new generation of Olympic hockey players. Well, the Minnesota-dominated American hockey team was the toast of Lake Placid, New York today, as Steve Young reports. After their stunning performance last night, the storybook American hockey team was out on the ice this afternoon, razzing members who came late for the practice. They were trying to stay psyched up and loose. Mark Johnson, who got the tying goal. Mike Aruzzioni, who gave the U.S. its 4-3 edge. And goalie Jim Craig, who held the Russians at bay during the longest 10 minutes of his life. Uh, they got a standing ovation at a news conference this afternoon. Then questions about the defeat of the Russians and their final game with Finland tomorrow. I think tomorrow maybe we have a little more pressure than uh, what we think and we just have to give that other team a little bit more respect than we gave even the Russians because of the fact that um, we have so much more at stake than we did yesterday. I think we realize what's in front of us. I feel right now we're all good enough athletes and good enough hockey players to, to realize that you know one win tomorrow it's going to give us a dream that um, very few people in, in the world can say they had a chance to do, and that's win a gold medal. At this point in the Winter Olympics, the Russians usually have it all locked up. This time, it's the closest Olympic ice hockey contest in history. If the U.S. beats Finland tomorrow, it will win the gold. If it loses and the Soviet Union and Sweden tie in their game, there is a slim statistical chance that the U.S. team could wind up without any medal in the four-way round robin. America's newest heroes weren't thinking much about that dark possibility this afternoon, but instead were enjoying their new celebrity. Steve Young, CBS News, Lake Placid, New York. There's an Olympic celebrity in Minneapolis who's watching these games as if he were in them once again. 78-year-old Richard Duke Donovan has not missed a minute of the games, uh, watching from his hospital room where he's being treated for cataracts. Duke competed in the 24 Olympics where he won the bronze medal for speed skating, a victory that has never lost its luster. Greatest thrill of your lifetime, I think. And uh, why? Uh, nobody. Uh, when you're out like that, particularly in a race like that, you don't get butterflies in your stomach. You you, you have a determination to to win. Well, the only thing that hasn't changed is get there first. <laughs> win. <laughs> <laughs> you know the snows don't last forever, so you're already planning now to top last year's harvest. You're also determined to beat the tough weed problems. You're using Eradicane herbicide. It was developed to control the toughest weeds in corn. With Eradicane, you get clean corn rows for easier harvest, for bigger yields. This year, plan to use Eradicane for the toughest weeds in corn. Donahue audiences are full of surprises. He's Irish, but he's nice. <laughs> Wanna go into profession? We have fathers who are stockbrokers, lawyers, and doctors. It's so well. <laughs> well, I don't know. If I knew I'd have the answer and I'd be rich and famous, then I wouldn't be on your show, you'd be on mine. Everybody gets into the act on Donahue. Join us. Monday through Friday at 8, here on Channel 4. Well, it's politics as usual tonight for the Republican presidential primary and the candidates try to debate in New Hampshire. The debate turned in kind of a big mess today. First, Ronald Reagan invited all of the candidates to take part into the debate. The original plan had only Reagan and George Bush scheduled. But then four of the secondary candidates walked off the stage in protest. Well, when they were told that they could not really debate, but only make a real statement, that's when it got tough. Then Reagan got into the argument with a newspaper publisher, and by the time the hassles occurred, not much debating had ever been done. But on the Democratic side, Senator Edward Kennedy today said that President Carter should impose 
wage and price control. The way that I propose to deal with the problem of inflation is by putting in a freeze, a freeze on prices, a freeze on interest rates, a freeze on rents, a freeze on dividends, a freeze on wages, a freeze across the board so that we can break the psychology of inflation. The folks who are backing Kennedy in Minnesota are not happy with the sample ballot to be used at Tuesday's precinct caucuses. The straw poll has no spot for the uncommitted, and Kennedy's people say that's no fair. That straw poll, though, is being put out by the Carter Mondale campaign. Power in numbers is the backbone of politics, and no doubt that's the motivation behind five former Minnesota congressmen. At a group press conference this morning, the five announced they will seek re-election to their former post this fall. Now, all five lost their seats in the 78 race, but now they say the voters are tired of the do-nothing Republicans in office, and they say the voters want to change. The Minnesota legislature has not finished this session, and already there are tax proposals for next. Duluth legislators got together with city officials this morning to talk about the future of Spirit Mountain, which is apparently going to need more help to survive. WCCO's Karen Boris now with that story. The ski runs on Spirit Mountain are kept open with a 1% tax on food and beverages. That tax runs out at the end of this year. Without the subsidy, the manager says Spirit Mountain will shut down by August of 1981. City officials aren't calling it quits. Uh, what we're hoping to do is, is to convince the general public that Spirit Mountain is worth paying that little extra sin tax, if you, if you want to call it that, that they would pay at a, at a bar and restaurant. There is plenty of time to make a decision. Officials are considering an increase in the sales tax, that's one alternative, or they could extend the current tax. That tax barely made it through the legislature last time and is hotly opposed by bar owners, who claim their patrons, who they characterize as the poor who don't ski, are paying for recreation facilities for the rich. There is this feeling that skiing is a, quote, elitist sport, and there are very few people using it, a uh, limited percentage, and really it's not true. Debate in Duluth is not confined to funding, but extends to the philosophy of the ski hill. What is Spirit Mountain? Now, is it a big city park? Are we to, you know, it would be no problem whatsoever to, I suppose, double or triple the figures if we wanted to sell a $1 lift ticket or a $2 lift ticket. Yeah, that'd be easy. Should Spirit Mountain make money or cost money? Out there on the slopes, they seem oblivious to that debate, which will move to the state capitol for the 1981 session. With photographer Art Roy, Karen Boris, WCCO Television News, Duluth. Well, there's no worry about the end of cross-country skiing out in Wisconsin. This is the annual Burka Binder Ski Marathon. About 5,000 skiers pulled off in Cable, Wisconsin this morning, and they slid all the way to Hayward, 55 kilometers away. Today's Burka Binder was won by Per Knoten of Norway. Duncan McLean of Michigan, the highest American finisher. McLean coming in 10th. Well, any hope of settling the firefighter strike in Chicago collapsed today. Union leaders have canceled the ratification vote on the agreement reached with the city yesterday. The union brass says too many details are not settled. The strike now is 11 days old. That strike for Chicago City employees to search for victims in a natural gas explosion. A house on the south side of Chicago blew up yesterday, and today a fourth body was found in the rubble. Non-striking firefighters are still searching for other victims of the explosion on Chicago's south side. An 11% across the board pay hike is in store for the Stokely Van Camp workers who have been on strike at the company's Lawrence, Kansas plant since December. The Fairmont, Minnesota company agreed to a 50 cent an hour increase now with a similar increase in 1981 and then again for 1982. Don, a Minneapolis man remains in the hospital tonight following an afternoon shooting incident. 28-year-old Cleophia Neal was shot in the stomach after an apparent fight with a relative. Police say the relative wanted to move in with Neal, but he wouldn't let him. A struggle ensued, a gun went off, and Neal was shot. He remains in satisfactory condition tonight. This evening, the Food and Drug Administration is warning the prescription drug triamthizide may be harmful to some kidney and heart patients. The drug is a diuretic, that means it's a fluid-releasing drug, and it has been marketed without FDA approval. The warning is for patients, especially older folks, who might develop heart irregularities. A long and brutal 
annual cross-country event, the Winnipeg to St. Paul snowmobile race. Its contestants are so determined to cross the finishing line, one man even drove the last 120 miles with a broken leg. And although Hot Lips Houlihan may appear slightly neurotic on TV's hit series MASH, off-screen she's an intelligent and outspoken feminist. Watch for these stories on the next... PM Magazine! Well, it's a heavy fog that appears to be blamed for the crash of a twin-engine plane coming from Wisconsin outside the New Orleans airport. The plane missed the airport, plunged into a nearby lake, Lake Pontchartrain, killing the seven passengers. Mike. The cleanup of several days of massive flood damage is underway now in Southern California, and one of the hardest-hit towns was San Jacinto, flooded out when a levee broke last Thursday. The residents were driven out of their homes by the high water. Some took up residence in the local high school gym. Well, the sun was out in Southern California today, a relief from a week of downpours. These middle-class Jacinto homeowners who could take the shock today started trying to dry out their soaked possessions. Now, mind you, these are not the fat cats of the Hollywood Hills. These folks in San Jacinto, many of them, don't even have yeah, insurance. when we started, and at least we got our cars and some furniture and roof over our head, and we did it once, we can do it again. I shed all my tears last night, and I'm not going to shed any more. It's, you can't save it, and you just can have to start over. And Bill Carlson starting over after something like that is it's going to be unreal with no insurance and... A couple of the foot of water coming through your home. Well, there were some potential problems, fortunately, that only developed in property damage. Nothing, uh, no individual Im uh, injuries. On the other side of the United States, on the southeastern areas, uh, North Carolina had seven or eight twisters touch down mm. today. Uh, but uh, there were a few buildings destroyed, but no injuries, no personal injuries. So we, uh, both ends of the country have had some problems in the last couple of days. Our present temperature in the Twin Cities going up again. 27 degrees matches the high, which first occurred at 4 o'clock this afternoon. Minus 3 degrees Celsius, that would be 78% humidity. The wind out of the southwest at 12 miles per hour. The barometer falling from 29.99. Here are the stats. Uh, with 27 the high, present temperature 2, 17 the low. 7 o'clock will be sunrise tomorrow morning, right on the dot, 5.53 for sunset. Here are the uh, present temperatures in Minnesota and Wisconsin. In the northern portion of Minnesota, uh, snow now occurring all across the northern portion of the state. Bemidji indicating snow, International Falls, Hibbing, all of those areas indicating snow at this hour. 18 degrees at Bemidji, 17 at Fargo-Moorhead. Alexandria reporting 25, 28 degrees at uh, Redwood Falls, 18 at Duluth, 26 at Rochester. Uh, La Crosse uh, indicating 25 degrees, it's 19 degrees now at Eau Claire. Here's the uh, WeatherNet report for high temperatures for today around uh, our area. Sandstone indicating 24, Rice Lake matching that, as does Owatonna, 26 degrees at Hutchinson, Annandale, 23, and St. Peter, 32 degrees. Uh, the high temperature map for the United States today indicates what was occurring. There is a low pressure system down here. You'll see it on the national map in just a moment. But that combined with this warm, moist air caused a great deal of uh, storm activity in the southeastern portion of the country. Some cool temperatures through our area, the 20s dipping down through Minnesota and almost exclusively in Minnesota for today. Uh, now let's take a look at the uh, WCCO Weather Watch color radar. No precipitation within our 120 nautical mile range. Satellite picture uh, since last night at about this time uh, shows uh, most of our five state area under the in influence of fair to partly cloudy skies with a few uh, uh, cloud cover with a bit of cloud cover moving across the area from time to time coming down from Canada now uh, so, uh, a cold front which will uh, bring snow overnight and probably well into tomorrow to the northern portion of our five state area only and here's that situation a uh, very warm temperatures shown by that uh, green and blue reflectance here here's the forecast for that part of the country for tomorrow uh, 65 degrees for example in Atlanta they'll have heavy rain there'll be some heavy thunder showers along uh, the north the North Carolina coastline, uh, perhaps extending up as far as Virginia. 47 degrees expected tomorrow for New York City, 58 degrees for uh, Washington, D.C., and 45 uh, for Boston. There will be some snow flurries in the Great Lakes region extending into New England. Now let's move to the other side of the country. Uh, fair to partly cloudy skies in the central portion of the area, but there will be rain once again along the Pacific coastline, especially in the Pacific Northwest, extending perhaps down as far as San Francisco, 
um, maybe even just a bit south of that. 65 degrees for Los Angeles tomorrow. They probably will be saved from rain, but not from cloudy skies. Here's the forecast for our metropolitan area. Partly cloudy overnight for the uh, metro area. Winds westerly at 10 to 5, 15 miles per hour. The overnight low somewhere between 10 and the middle teens. The high tomorrow ex expected to get up uh, to about 22 degrees. Partly cloudy skies and a cooling influence will be felt. That will last probably through Monday, maybe even into Tuesday when things will start to warm up again. Here's the extended forecast showing that uh, little or no precipitation will be the situation. Cloud cover, uh, perhaps some light clouds Tuesday through Thursday. 15 to 30 degrees, the highs and those warmer highs will occur in the latter portion of the week. Overnight lows from 5 below to 10 above and that 5 below situation probably Monday or Tuesday. All right. Thank you, Bill. Good forecast. On a sunny day, like today, stained glass windows really seem to come to life, to sparkle, as they did this day in Minneapolis, where that age-old art form is really flourishing. Barb Brown is here with that story. It took five people five years to complete the 60 stained glass windows in the Basilica of St. Mary in Minneapolis. Hundreds of thousands of individual pieces of glass painted, fired, and framed with strips of lead in a tradition that goes back to the 5th and 6th centuries. And 50 years later, the Minneapolis firm which did those basilica windows is still creating stained glass for churches, for restaurants, and for homes. Originally, residential was all old Victorian style of work, and when people started coming in, that's what they were used to doing. Now, they're becoming a little more sophisticated and looking at it as an art form and we're doing more and more contemporary pieces. The change in style might also be attributed to cost. But many windows were done where every piece of glass in the whole window were painted. Um, it's an extremely expensive technique now. They may not get orders for 60 basilica windows these days, but the demand for varied designs is a welcome challenge to local stained glass artists. Barb Brown, WCCO Television News, Twin Cities. What a conference! What a conference! What conference, sir? Managers from three states just bought my proposal. But there's no one in there, sir. I know. I dialed the operator and brought everyone together on a long-distance conference call. We did the job in minutes instead of days. Why, that's wonderful, sir! No, Miss Kern, that is genius! A long-distance conference call. It's a way to get things done today. You know, so many times in life we ask people to do something for us, and then they do it. We forget to say thank you. I've asked you to buy Jimmy Dean's sausage. You did, and I thank you. Mike makes your day. He brings you the world, the stars, and the songs. Mike makes your day. He does what you like to and takes you along. Mike Douglas, weekday afternoons at 3.30, here on Channel 4. Linda Fratiani got a silver medal tonight in women's figure skating, coming in second to East Germany skater. One of the surprises in, in the Winter Olympics in Lake uh, Placid, New York tonight. Eric Hyden, meanwhile, won his fifth gold medal, setting a world record in the 10,000 meters earlier today. Richard Wagner reports now on that event from Lake Placid, New York. There can be no more doubts if there were any left. Eric Hyden proved today he's the greatest speed skater who has ever set blade to ice. 10,000 meters was the distance today, something over six miles, and not only did Eric win, he broke the world record. He's now won five gold medals in distances ranging from 500 to 10,000 meters. There are no more to win. He's won them all. No man in any previous Winter Games ever won more than three. When we caught up with him in the Olympic Village this afternoon, the 21-year-old Marvel was a trace nonchalant about his accomplishment. Uh. I won five gold medals in the speed skating. That's about it, and uh, I skated the best that I could. In other events today, women's slalom, Hanni Wenzel of Liechtenstein came in first, West Germany second, Switzerland third, Cindy Nelson of Lutzen came in 11th. In the 90-meter men's ski jump, Finland won it, Austria second, Finland third, Jim Denny of the U.S. and Duluth was the best U.S. showing in eighth place, and he announced after that that he was through with competitive skiing. 
Men's 50-kilometer cross-country won by Russia, Finland second, Russia third. Bill Koch made the best U.S. showing, and he came in 13th. And in women's figure skating, Annette Poich of East Germany won it. Linda Fratiani of the U.S. came in second, and Dagmar Lertz of West Germany got a third place. The North Stars are leading the Rangers 4-2 midway in the third period tonight in the Sports Center. New York opened the scoring just over a minute into the match. Dom Maloney put the puck into the North Star net off the faceoff. The Stars even the score on this play. Brad Maxwell swoops in on the Ranger net, slides a rebound under the New York goalie and into the net. The Stars doubled their lead a short time later. Kent Eric Anderson's persistence finally paid off, and the Stars led 2-1 after the first period. Bobby Smith and Al McAdam combined on a goal in the second period, number 35 this year from McAdams. And the North Stars are leading the Rangers 4-2 with now about eight minutes to go in the final period in the Sports Center. Elsewhere in the NHL, Washington over Chicago, 6-2. That was an afternoon game. And tonight, Montreal 5-1 over Detroit. UMD over at Williams Arena defeated the Gopher hockey team 7-4, and that gives them a split on the weekend series. The Gophers had won 7-5 last night. The kicks open the North American, hockey, North American Soccer League indoor season in the Western Division playoffs with a convincing 6-3 defeat of Memphis, Memphis this afternoon in the Sports Center. Alan Willey, professional soccer's artful Dodger, opened the scoring in the first period with this goal. Ricardo Alonso sent the kicks into the locker room at halftime with a 2-0 lead after that goal. And the kick struck quickly in the second half for two more. John Bain scored the first. And then Chico Hamilton headed in the other. Tim Trollman led the kicks with a pair of goals. His second capped the scoring. The second and deciding game of the Western Conference Championship Series will take place on Tuesday night in Memphis. Now, if the Rogues win that match, the series will be decided by a 15-minute minigame. The Gopher basketball team turned, its, turned in its worst performance of the season in dropping a 70-55 decision to Wisconsin this afternoon in Madison. And that loss was the Gophers' third straight, and it left them with a record of 8-6 and six in the conference. The Badgers led 33-18 at the half, and at one point in the third period, pulled to a 25-point lead. Claude Gregory led Wisconsin with 20 points. Russ Matthews added 16. Darrell Mitchell. Darrell Mitchell of the Gophers had 19 points. The win assured the Badgers of their first winning season in four years. Ohio State held on to its share of the Big Ten basketball lead with Indiana by slipping past Iowa 70-69 this afternoon in Columbus. It was the Buckeyes' first win at home over Iowa in five years. Iowa pulled into the lead by one point, 69-68, 16 seconds to go, and Kevin Doyle's bucket from the corner. The Buckeyes pulled the game out with seven seconds to go, and Herb Williams bounced a shot in off the glass to put Ohio State ahead for good, 70-69. Elsewhere, major scores of note, Purdue by three over Illinois, Northwestern by two over Michigan State, Indiana by four over Michigan. Maryland defeated Virginia, North Carolina State over Wake Forest, North Carolina defeated Duke, Tennessee over Auburn, Brigham Young defeated Wyoming, Syracuse over Boston College, Alabama beat Vanderbilt, St. Cloud over Moorhead, Missouri defeated Kansas State. In three overtimes, Anoka Ramsey defeated Golden Valley Lutheran. Washington State over Southern Cal, Michigan Tech defeated UMD, Clemson over North Carolina of Asheville, St. John's of New, of New York over Providence, McAllister defeated St. Olaf, Bethel over Concordia, St. John's defeated St. Mary's, and DePaul, the nation's number one team, still unbeaten, 94-87 over Chicago Loyola. Joanne Carner and Sandra Post share the third round lead in the LPGA in Sarasota, Florida. Bob Gilder has overtaken Tom Watson and has a one-stroke lead over last year's leading money winner entering tomorrow's final round of the Los Angeles Open beginning at 3 o'clock here on Channel 4. Although he suffered a second-round knockdown, Howard Davis today scored his 13th straight win with a unanimous decision over Villamar Fernandez in a 12-round lightweight bout in Atlantic City, New Jersey. The Crusher and Nick Bockwinkel on the pro wrestling card tomorrow night in the St. Paul Auditorium. And the U.S. clinched its North American Zone Davis Cup Series against Mexico with a victory by its doubles team of John McEnroe and Peter Fleming. How I've got kind of an unusual thing I've got to do. I've, I've got to do two things tonight. One, leave on a happy note and uh, part on a sad one at the same time. We read a story during the beginning of the uh, program about a twin-engine airplane that had crashed down in Lake Pontchartrain toward New Orleans. 
New Orleans, and we had not uh, given you any kind of description about the plane nor the people who were aboard that plane, and unfortunately, we have some information now that may come as a shock to some people. Uh, we do know some of the people who were aboard that plane, seven people were killed in that plane, and some of them were from Edina. Uh, we'd like to give you those names now because they have been released by the coroner in Pontchartrain, New Orleans, the parish down there. The names, uh, a Mrs. Era Burwell, uh, her daughter, a 17-year-old, also named Era Burwell, David Burwell, 14 years old, and the pilot, who was from Shakopee, Minnesota, uh, Mike James, was his name. That seems kind of unusual uh, to have that in juxtaposition uh, to what I'm just about to tell you, because uh, as death happens, uh, so does life, and I happen to have a story to tell you, and uh, perhaps they can run the videotape. It might tell you a little bit better. About a year ago, I was uh, sitting at this news desk and they showed you these pictures. This was April 8th. That's my wife, Barbara. And uh, in just a moment, you'll see a daughter named uh, Lacey Jeanette, and that's me. And now you see a girl named Delta. And that happened not too long ago. Six pounds, 11 ounces. <laughs> Delta. I thought you'd lost your voice cheering for the Olympic hockey team. Now I know you were cheering for mom and daughter. Daughter. That's exactly right. <laughs> Congratulations. Well, thank you very much, Papa sir. Papa three times. Yes, and three girls, and, uh, and I think I'm blessed. And I, thank, uh, and I thank God for that. All right. Thank you for joining us tonight. And uh, on that note, we'll leave you. Please join us tomorrow at 5.30 and at 10 o'clock. Good night.